Okay? Now we got down here next a call from David Watkins. He is Helicopter Dave, the guy that took the helicopter golfing and got fired. He did take the helicopter golfing and he did get fired, but it wasn't for flying that helicopter, going on the golfing in the helicopter. He is uh, head of White House Personnel Administration. Uh, a lady who works for him that we probably all know is uh, uh, named uh, Patsy Thomason. Okay. The lady who was in Foster's office that night grieving with Maggie Williams and Bernie Nussbaum as they checked out everything in the office. Uh, right after Burton calls Gavin, Watkins called Gavin. About the same time he received a call from another White House staffer identified as David Watkins. As best he recalls, Watkins also inquired about the weapon and to the best of Gavin's recollection informed Gavin that he was a personal friend, so on and so on. So the first two questions out of these two White House heavies' mouths when they call the park police after learning of the death is, tell us all about the gun. David Watkins grew up with Vince in Hope. He was a Hope boy. Known him for their whole lives. You call up to check with the cops about the death? Tell me about the gun. Who owned it? What's the registration? I need to know right now. Figure it out. Next one. I know I'm beating this to death, but it, it, we could cover a, a, another 20 hours of, of other issues, but these are the, the sexy ones, and uh, I'm hoping I'm not overmaking my point. Handwritten interview notes. Uh, David Watkins. Number three, also asked about weapon down here. Oh, yeah, this is, this is, Gavin typed these up that night. Burton was very concerned about the registration of the weapon. They asked several times. Give me a break. He was freaking out. He asked several times because he got an answer he really didn't want to hear. Wrong gun. Next one. This is a brain surgery. I mean, yeah, this is right here. This is all, all these are government documents. They're all public. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and pick it up here. Uh, this is Star. He talks about discrepancies in the description of the kind of gun seen in Mr. Foster's hand. He goes down here to this footnote. Now, look at what this lawyer is doing here. He's saying, well, you know, this is a little shaky here about this whole, you know, I pointed all this out to him. Uh, I was interviewed, and I, they got copies of that big report of mine. He knew he had a problem. So here's what he says. He says, well, you know, this gun, we have discrepancies in the witness accounts of what it looked like. Well, okay, yeah, you can expect some of that. But he's talking about what these witnesses describe the gun as being. <sighs> Who cares? They got the damn gun. You don't need to take an opinion poll. You go look at the gun. Okay? It's irrelevant in this context. It's very relevant in tracing the bouncing guns that went in and out of Mr. Foster's hand that night. But he, talking about, well, you know, there, there's a lot of controversy about really what this official death weapon looks like. One witness said this, one said that, you know. Who cares? You got the gun, okay? I mean, anyway, next one. Sorry about the sarcasm. I've been warned about that. Okay, anyway, this is Star, just to bring Mr. Star up to speed here. Now, he's cute. He, unlike Mr. Fisk, talks about silver-colored gun, but watch. Uh, she recalls she described a silver-colored gun. That's one we've heard about, a cowboy gun. Why is it a cowboy gun? Silver six-gun, large barrel, cowboy gun. Okay, she did not find the silver-colored gun the night like we talked about when she checked. May 9, 1994, that's the FBI interview we read. The actual gun that was recovered, she was shown it, and she said, according to the interview report, it may be a gun which she formerly saw in her residence, Little Rock. She may have seen the handgun. This is all we've heard all this. Star is relying on the fact that People don't remember that ABC TV News broadcast that black gun photo in March of 94. It was carried on the Reuters wire. It was printed in Time Magazine, March 18th issue, 1996. He's gone the other route. He's talking about, yeah, it's a silver gun. Yeah, yeah, it's the one she brought up. That's the official death gun. It's a blank out here. We know the gun is black, but he tries. Watch this. Just a second. Let me find it. Okay, next one. Next page. Star has to, he has to say something here, right? Uh, this is just talking about how they go upstairs and they're hunting for the, the gun and they can't find the silver one. Next one. Okay, two guns, one of which was missing. Let's, let's go on to the next one. This is, I'm just bringing up this repeated star information. You know, star's on board too. Now, the... Whoops, something's slightly out of order. Uh, yeah, but... And maybe we'll see this in a second. What Star says in his report, and I may have left out this biograph, he says, well, when she saw the gun at the interview, you know, the one where, was she shown a silver one when it was supposed to be black, or was she shown a black one and did she say it was silver? What Star has her say is that, well, when she was in that interview, she remembered 
the barrel of the silver colored gun that you brought up in Little Rock looked a little bit lighter in color than the barrel of the totally black gun. Okay? It's just nuts. Oh, by the way, she was on Prozac. She gave a, gave a long interview and they had her on Prozac for about 10 months at that point. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. This is the final little tidbit on the gun. Uh, this is to the lead park police investigator at the body site. He's under oath. When you first saw the body, can you describe which position the hands were in? He doesn't want to lie. So he says, like this. Well, the questioner is not that stupid. You are indicating palms up. Yes, palms up. Down by the side. Remember the gun photo we saw? Palm was down, cupping that black gun, right? The lead investigator said the gun was in his hand and the gun and the hand was palm up. They were flopping around as they were bringing these guns in and out, sports fans. That's all that's going on here. And, and nobody cares about this. I mean, you know, it's, this is only the in charge at the body site. Next one. Okay, change of pace. New star information. This is kind of cute. That has to do with the gun, because he, he's trying to come up with any way he can to link this gun to the Foster family, and he came up with the oven mitt. And the basic theory is this. This would be the star line. Uh, Vince Foster got that gun from home that we've all heard about. Of course, we know it's the wrong color or whatever. And he had to sneak it out to his car, so he went down to the kitchen, and he found an oven mitt. And he took the oven mitt back up to wherever that gun was kept, and he slipped the gun in the oven mitt, and he put the oven mitt in his glove compartment. He drove to the park later that day, pulled the gun out of the oven mitt, leaving the oven mitt in the glove compartment, walked up into the park, sat, sat down, and shot himself. And he carried the gun. I don't know how many gun people there are here. Uh, officially, Mr. Foster carried the four-inch barrel Colt 38 revolver in the left pocket, the left side pocket of his dress slack. Now, Vince was not a gun guy. That's clear in the record. Uh, obviously, he wasn't going to go striding across the park with a gun. I mean, there could be somebody in there with a cell phone who'd call in 911 and trash your suicide. So he wouldn't do that. Star is saying he put the gun in his left pocket. It's kind of awkward. You know, your suit, you know. But if I were Vince and doing what Vince has supposedly done, how would I have done it? He, had, he was dressed in a two-piece suit. His suit jacket was found on the right front passenger seat of the car with his wallet in it and his White House ID. Vince wanted to get the gun across the park, 750 feet, to sit down on that godforsaken slope in the middle of nowhere and blow his brains out, and he didn't want the gun to be seen. Hot July day, weekday, Fort Marcy Park. You get out of your car, you take the gun in your hand, you drape your jacket over your hand. Vince didn't do the obvious. He left the jacket in the car and shoves this gun in his suit pocket and kind of goes across the park for 800 feet. But back to the oven mitt. This is fantastic. First of all, bottom line, there is no chain of custody on the oven mitt. Star says the oven mitt was in the glove compartment of the park that night. We know there were photos taken of the front seat contents in the park that night. Those photos are so bad in the record, we can't, I mean, they could, they could show a pink chimpanzee. We don't know what they show. Uh, Star does say, well, we got a picture of the oven mitt the next day at the CIB impound lot at Anacostia Station. I'm going to show you that picture. It's pretty crummy, but it, it is a picture. My point is, number one, I don't think this whole oven mitt thing uh, is, is believable. But let's say it is believable. Based upon the information Star tells us, it's worthless. And the reason it's worthless, even though you believe it happened, is because guess what? There is no chain of custody. The oven mitt was in the sole possession, according to Starr, of Bill Kennedy, another Rose Law Firm lawyer, worked for Mr. Starr in the White House. He had it in his possession for 10 months when he thoughtfully handed it over to Starr 10 months later. So even if it was there, there ain't no chain of custody. Now, let's... Uh, Oh yeah, this says that. Mr. Kennedy maintained the contents of the car not been taken into evidence by the park police. You're the park police. You open up the glove compartment. We'll get to that. This is oven mitt. Fill in the whole damn glove compartment. You don't take it into evidence. You don't ever mention it in any of your reports. It's, it's stranger than fiction. Kennedy hands it over. Uh, oven mitt. Okay, let's go. Uh, oh yeah, and then... Two and three years later, 95 and 96, the two park police investigators are interviewed and they go, oh yeah, I remember it. It was there. But let's see what happened earlier. Next one. 
I mean, I don't want to treat this man's death lightly, but some of this is truly Keystone Cop stuff. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lee of OJ fame, he found some, a hunk of sunflower husk in the left pocket and a sunflower seed husk in the mitt. So they're linking the, the, the mitt and the gun that way. Also, Lee did a, apparently a gas chromatography run on the inside pocket, got a little lead, got a little antimony and lead in the mitt. So this is just forensic stuff after the fact that Dr. Lee has come up with to, to make the linkage. Next one. But this gets to be the good part here. Okay. This is the only public FBI interview that Star cites for Kennedy telling them about the oven mitt. Uh, it goes in here about where the car was for all these months. Kennedy retrieved miscellaneous items from the vehicle. He described the car as being trash with family junk, M&Ms, plastic cups, class notes, CD players, shoes, Ray-Ban, sunglasses, books, etc. This interview that Star cites for the existence of the oven mitt doesn't mention the oven mitt. Star cites one other FBI interview of Kennedy. I don't know what it says because it, for some reason, was not made public. Next one. Gets better. 